Well, good morning. We're glad you're here today. This morning, we're going to be led in worship by some of our graduating seniors. Let's sing together. Good morning and thank you for joining us for worship today. My name is Brian. I'm the student pastor at the MJ campus. Normally you would see Scott and Lynn up here, but they have asked for a couple of guys that look better to do this. So here we are. Uh, We forgot our potatoes, but we'll do better next week. Uh, I want to remind you, uh, there are multiple ways to give uh, here. You can go to our app and give through our app, or you can go to our website, give through that. Or you can mail your check in. Uh, But most importantly, we want to thank you for your heart. 
continuing to give. Um, and we just thank you for being obedient to that. Yeah. And here momentarily, our lead teaching pastor, Justin Lett, is going to be joining us to give a message in our Disciple Culture series. And we're looking forward to that. And today is a special day. Seniors uh, speak uh, on behalf of John for this too, because I know his heart feels the same way. We love you. We miss you. Uh, and today is Senior Recognition Day, and we're excited about that. John, tell them what. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we've worked pretty hard on this, especially the production team. We've worked really hard around this. I know this has been done in years past, and I know you guys have been waiting for it. So if you will, join us as we watch a little bit of a slideshow showing some of the goofy child pictures and now these awesome senior photos uh, just giving recognition to our seniors. So join us. What an awesome slideshow. Uh, so moving, get to see the baby pictures and, and you guys as seniors now. Uh, what I want to do, take a second right now, is pray for our MJ seniors. So pray with me. Father, we thank you for this day. Um, we know that so much uh, has been taken away from our seniors, but we also know that you chose them, Father, to walk through this. So we know that you see something special in them. We know that you're teaching them something that we can't see right now. And I firmly believe with all my heart, Lord, a lot of these seniors are going to be um, people who bring direct change into the world we're living. So, Father, I just pray that you would continue to walk with them. Lord, give them grace, uh, wisdom, and understanding through all this, Father. I know they're hurting, but we thank you that we have the opportunity to celebrate them, the hard work that they have done, the achievements that they have accomplished. We're proud of them, God, and we're so thankful that we just get to play a small part in their lives. Thank you for allowing us to witness uh, the incredible young men and women they have grown up to be. Lord, we just pray for them. Pray when they go to the next chapter, Lord, that they will continue to impact those around them and make your son Jesus famous wherever they go. We love you and we thank you for them. And we pray all this in your son Jesus Christ's name. 
Amen. Let's continue in worship. Turn your eyes up. 
Jesus, this morning we're thankful that if we look to you, that our view, our paradigm can be totally reshifted. God, you are good, and this morning we choose to focus on who you are and what you've done for us. And so we ask that you teach us now as we open your word. We lift your name high and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I want to say congratulations to all of our graduates, and I want to encourage the class of 2020 to take this year that may have been just a bit of a disappointment, and I want to offer you a different perspective. I want to say that this very unique year has served as the most memorable to date, and what has served as catalyst to lead you into this kind of graduation, our quarantine, is also my encouragement to you. You see, many graduates before you have had a lot going on. Their graduation was filled with activity. It was loud, if you will. But yours has served to be quite the opposite. It's been silent, intimate, if you will. And I don't know if that isn't better, maybe more sovereign and specifically ordained by God. You see, I think that maybe the reason God made your class and its graduation so memorable is because it desires he desires for you to serve as a catalyst to the rest of all of culture. That he desires for you to serve as a catalyst for how the church is actually to pursue him. And that is found more in the silence. That we would walk and search for God more in silent and small ways than we do simply looking for him in the big and the loud. Today, we're going to look at the discipline of silence and how important it is. And I hope to explain just how important the church walking in silence actually is through this sermon. But I want to pray before we go any further. I think it's really important we listen intently to who is actually speaking. So Father, I just ask that in this moment, in this time, you would come and you'd speak and we'd not misconstrue who it is who's speaking to us. So search the recesses of our minds and our hearts and I pray you'd speak by the power of your spirit to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to open our minds and thoughts to an image of what, what we all experience, what we all feel emotionally when we look over a vista at a lookout and we take in a, like the Grand Canyon or a, a, a mountain uh, escape. I want to ask us to imagine what it's like to sit in prairie land and look up away from the city lights and see the stars like saucers shining back at us. I want us to imagine like getting up for the first time and having your breath taken away in the middle of morning after the first good snow as you walk outside and see the snow glistening back at you in the silence. And I want you to imagine how you feel in all those moments and how that doesn't serve to simply reset the soul and make you far more aware of your surroundings than maybe you were before. I think that we have a tendency to get really muffled and caught up in a lot of background noise that forces us to miss what is happening around us in detail. I learned the importance of silence from many ways, but one of the most paramount was from a deaf friend. He taught me about all the sounds that I was missing in my background as I sped through life pursuing God solely in the big. You see, my, my friend lives in a world of silence. His faith is genuine and there's actually no emotion tied to it whatsoever. But he, he, he marveled as we got him to try the cochlear implant for the first time. And he spoke up with awe about the sound that a light switch makes when it comes on. Because his life had been so silent at this point that that click seemed like a major boom in his life. <laughs> that taught me that we can miss some really important things when our lives aren't practicing moments of silence. I mean, how many of us have ever even considered or hear any longer the click that the flick of a light switch makes? You see, silence is incredibly important for us to hear all of the things, even the flick of a light switch, to notice that detail. 
I want to encourage us by thinking through the fact that the most important things in life are always said in a whisper. Like when someone tells you that they love you, when they come close to you and they pull your face into them and they look you in the eyes and they gaze into you, whispering to you their affection, it communicates a sincerity. It communicates something deep. It means something deep for you and for me. Because silence rests and it intends to reset the soul. We feel it deep within us. As the prophet Samuel was first learning how to hear God as the, the Lord called out to him in the middle of the night while he was sleeping, his, his mentor taught him a really important phrase that I think that we should learn. He taught him to go back to his room and in the sanctity and the quiet of his own bedroom, he asked him to utter uh, to the Lord as he called out to him again, speak for your servant is listening. This important phrase is something that I think we need to not only remember but practice because this discipline of silence is about silencing all the other voices that are vying for our attention and silencing the fears and anxieties that continually force us to take the path of least resistance, missing out on maybe the perfect things that the person of Jesus, your Lord and Savior, who loves you unconditionally desires for you. And it also steals the opportunity to take those fears and anxieties as we've been called by First Peter, to place them before his feet because he loves us and he desires to care for us. You see, as, as Jesus comes out of that, the, the place where we were last week in Bethsaida and he's now walking with the disciples in his next set of verses in Mark 8, walking towards Caesarea Philippi, he asks this all-important question that all of us have to answer. It isn't accompanied by a massive display of his power or some miracle for the masses. It isn't accompanied by anything big and loud. It is a conversation in the silence, away from the crowds, away from all of the big, and it's alone with his closest friends on the planet. Here, I'll read it to you. In Mark 8, verse 27, it says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, Who do the people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still one of the other prophets. Verse 29, but what about you, he asked. Like, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, well, you're the Messiah. Jesus warned that they not tell anyone about him. See, this instance is also recorded in Matthew, and this conversation in Matthew takes a little bit more detail. So I want to read that as well. Matthew 16, verse 13, it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he He asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied and said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, well, you were the Messiah. You're the very Son of the living God. In verse 17, there's this distinction. I love this detail in Matthew. He says, Jesus replied, and blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. I want to key on a few things. First of all, I love that line in verse 17 of Matthew 16, it says that he replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. I'm going to talk about the distinction of his name. And then he says, this wasn't revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my father in heaven. He says that you can only find this answer to this very key question that we all must give answer to in the silence. See, this will be asked in the whisper. Jesus distinguishes the name of Simon Peter as he talks to him very intimately. As he gives an accurate answer for who Jesus' identity is, he speaks right back into his own identity. Simon, he separates the name and says, Simon is supposed to refer to your old life. And Jesus will refer to this name, this name that was given to him by his father, the fisherman, Jonah or John. He'll refer to it in the future as Peter makes decisions fearfully or he responds Uh, not in faith, as he acts as he would have before as a coward. He'll say that name Simon, but then he, 
he comes over here and he says, I don't want to focus on that name anymore. I want to focus on Peter, which means Petra, a rock. And I want to focus on the new life that you have in me, the new way that I'm calling into, one founded in God's intentional purpose for you. And the Father's revealed to you who I am, so now I can reveal to you who you truly are and why I created you in my very image. You see, the most important question that anyone can answer is who do you say Jesus is? And by your testimony verbally or by your lifestyle decisions, do you live seeking to honor Him as worship? Or do you simply honor yourself as you walk through life, continually making decisions that worship yourself? It's an answer that doesn't come by jumping from pep rally to pep rally, or revival to revival, large event to large event. It's an answer found right now in the resources, recesses of your own mind and your own heart as God whispers to you and I. Do you truly trust the person of Jesus Christ? Trust his character? Trust his capabilities? Trust him implicitly? You see, this can't be answered for a friend by you or uh, by someone else. This can't be answered for you and it can't be answered by you for someone else. You cannot answer for anyone. You can only answer for you. And accountably, our response determines everything. It determines our eternity, our life in the hereafter. It determines our life right here on the planet, whether we accept the life that He has for us, whether it be abundant or not, a life on earth here that truly has peace and purpose, or if it's one that just continues to run around without any answer, direction, and in a frenetic pace like the rest of the culture around us. One that's loud and boisterous. You see, the most important response to this question is repentance. In fact, that response is what determined the separation between the religious leaders of Judaism that we've been reading about and the townspeople of Bethsaida that we looked at last week and his disciples. It it separates the sheep from the goats, as the Gospels reveal. Those that rejected him as a person couldn't deny his capabilities. In fact, his capabilities drew crowds. That's what we looked at last week. But this is a question of surrender and implicit trust. The whole person of Jesus, like 100% God and 100% man, do we truly believe because we've accepted what the Spirit has revealed under the direction of the Father about who Jesus truly is? He's not only Savior, He's Lord, and He's in control of all things. And each of us, you and I, were created in His very image for a specific purpose in his kingdom. You see, we, we notice that he taught Elijah this in his life back in 1 Kings as the Lord slowed things down and, and taught him in a really intimate moment with just the two of them who he is and how Elijah was to follow him. You see, Elijah had experienced God in the big. He had seen God do some really major things in his life preceding this moment of quiet where it's just the two of them. He had experienced his people going through a drought And the only one that could answer that drought was the prayer of Elijah. And when he prayed, rain came. They had experienced the infidelity of Israel and their tendency to put one foot in God's camp and one foot in Baal's. And in idolatry, in their idolatrous ways of worshiping Baal, they, they were like Elijah said, enough's enough. You have 450 prophets. I alone am left. And he drew a line in the sand. And they finally did determine in 1 Kings 18, who in fact was God and who wasn't. And when God showed himself alone, the one true God, taking by fire an completely soaked offering and letting nothing be left, the people celebrated. However, the people who hated God put a hit on Elijah's life, which led to this moment in silence, this moment of intimacy with the, with the Lord himself. He responded and saw God act in his life in major ways, showing huge displays of power. But once he did that, it earned him a death sentence from those who truly hated God. So he runs for his life as far as he can in fear, and God pursues him even in his running. It's found in 1 Kings 19. I'm going to read it. It says, He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached the mountain of Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, What? are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and your prophets have been put to death by the sword, and I alone am left. And now they want to kill me too. 
The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but he wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, upon it came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the, mountain, or the mouth of the cave. And that voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Emphasis should be placed on anything that we hear twice in Scripture. And that's why the writer is emphasizing that this question was asked of him twice. And it was asked in a whisper and it was asked in silence because this question is really saying, Elijah, why are you running in fear? Why did you run as far as here? I'm going to follow you. I'm not going to let you go. I want to meet you even when you're running from me because I love you. But I had you. You've already seen my power on display not once but multiple times. And I had you. What? What? was going to really challenge your life? Don't I always provide for you? Don't I always protect you? Why have you run here just because circumstances changed? You see, the truth of the matter is this. The religious leaders of Jesus' day, as we've been reading, they responded to this very question of what do we do with Jesus? Like, who do we say he is? They responded to that in rejection. The townspeople of Bethsaida, they were only interested in his miracles, and they responded much like the religious leaders. Elijah responded in fear by running after seeing massive miracle. The other disciples in this passage in Mark 8 and in Matthew 16, they did so as well momentarily. They they were willing, they were fine to speak up for everyone else when they asked, who do the people say that I am? They all had an answer. But they were terrified to speak and be accountable for their own answer when he asked that question of them. It says that, Only one answered, and that was Peter, and he responded in faith. He alone spoke up. It says that Jesus, in his response, not only is is honored, but he speaks directly back to Peter intimately. It says that he explains that this is only revealed by the will of the Father, in the whisper of the very soul, in silence and in conviction, to reveal who Jesus truly is by the power of His Spirit. It isn't revealed by man to us, nor by the displays of the miraculous. The people in Jesus' day that rejected Him saw the same miracles that His followers did. But they didn't repent, and they didn't follow. See, all those big pronouncements... They, they make the way. They provide the way. And it's not to say that He isn't always in the big. Because there were moments where he was. But they go before him. Jesus, more times than not, is in the mundane and the quiet and the natural. See, these people that, whether Bethsaida, the townspeople, who couldn't deny his capabilities, his abilities, they marveled at those. But some, because of them, only pressed further into selfishness, only further into darkness, further into spiritual blindness. They didn't respond to his teaching, to his character, They didn't surrender to the person of Jesus. They played ignorant. Many denied him, denied his love. They all denied his authority and in the end sought to end him. But Peter's response alone is genuine. It's a response in faith. It's much like the response that he gave in John 6 when Jesus tells the masses the cost of discipleship and they leave him in droves and he turns to find only his 12 and he says, are you not going to leave too? And Peter responds. He says, to where can we go? Your words have life. Your words alone have life. Much like his response here in Mark 8. Well, you're the Messiah, the one we've waited on, the Son of the living God. I mean, we can't go anywhere else. There's no other person. There's no other experience on earth. There's no other religious teaching or display of power that, that equates to you. It's you alone where we find life and security and peace and purpose. There's nothing on the earth that can satisfy like you. Peter's saying, I get it. I, I trust it. I receive it. I repent. And again, because Peter had surrendered, then in Matthew's account, Jesus reciprocates by seeking directly into the divine intention that he had for Peter when he dreamt him before the foundation of the world. For the purpose which, with, with which Peter was made, he drops the Simon, his earthly, fleshly name that was given to him by his earthly father, to focus, 
to focus on the name that meant stability and foundation, and it would serve to manifest as a divine call in his life as an apostle and a practitioner of the early New Testament church. Names in that day described what someone did. Simon the fisherman, natural and earthly, was pretty definitive. But God wanted to focus Peter and focus on Peter's name and his intention as the apostle by giving him a supernatural definitive and a mission. He wanted to focus on Peter being the first person to preach and birth the New Testament church, and we would baptize 3,000 men, not including women and children, when he did it. He wanted to focus on how Peter would be an influence for the kingdom as a patriarch of the New Testament church. And the question we have this morning, as we look at how people respond to Jesus, who do you say he is? Will you respond to the question of Jesus with faith or in fear? Will you, in fact, reject him, or will you repent and receive him? I, I want to ask, like, what is Jesus trying to whisper to you right now? What is he trying to say here in the silence of your own heart and mind? How is he pursuing you and what he's trying to say? Forget about all the other distractions. Forget about everything that's vying for your attention and all that you have to do after you get up from this moment. Forget about all your fears and anxieties of what's going to happen through quarantine, if you're going to keep your job, if you're going to lose your job, if you have a paycheck. I want you to focus. I want to be present. I want it to be as if Jesus walked right into your living room and he wants to sit down and look you straight in the face and he wants to whisper to you the most important things. And he asks you this question, what, who do you say that I am? No one else can answer for you. I'm going to hold you accountable for eternity for how you answer this question. We can't tend to hear Jesus in these really important moments like this when we're only looking for him in the big. So he's pulled you close right now, desires to whisper to you and to whisper his love for you, his intention for you. And as he does, what is your response? What are you going to say back to him as he whispers to you? What will you do with what he says to you? Are you going to receive it? Reciprocate? Turn and repent from your old ways? Or will you turn away from him and rejecting him and his love? You see, right now we're all responding to a message like this. There's no way to get around it. We can't run away from it. And if you're here today and you're listening and you go, I... I'm actually encouraged. I'm engaged in this conversation. I'd like to go a little further. I'd like to talk further about it. I want to give you an opportunity to respond in one of a few ways. Today, if you would like to talk to someone, please email us at prayeratthefellowship.cc. We'd love the opportunity to introduce you further to the person of Jesus. And if you're making a decision to follow him, we'd love to know and how we can help you take the very next step in Jesus. Maybe if you're here and you are saved, you are in fact a believer, and you trust him. However, you've been seeking him only in the big. How loud, how fast, how big is your life in the pursuit of Jesus? Are you moving from event to event and missing him in the silent? Consequently, missing the most important things that he desires to say to you. Right now in the recesses and the sancti- recess of your mind and heart and the sanctity of your own home, right there in your living room, as he seeks you out, I just... Have a conversation with him in intimacy. And this week, I want you to practice something. I want you to practice getting away physically, emotionally, mentally to a place of rest, a place where you can reset the soul. And I want you to practice saying this, Lord, speak for your servant is listening. Much like young Elijah was taught to respond to the Lord. Today, if you're listening and you don't know him and you're answering this question for real for the first time, Who do you say Jesus is? He is whispering his love to you and your response to him right now and how you answer that question is paramount. It determines everything for you. If you're wanting to receive and repent, then I'm going to encourage you to pray with me right now and I'm going to help you to pray. I'm going to ask you just to pray with me in the silence of your own heart and answer his pursuit of you. Pray like this. Say, Father, here I am and as Jesus pursues me, I'm responding to Jesus because I know of his love. I know of his unconditional receiving of me. He doesn't expect it to be something that I'm not. And just like he did with Peter, I desire to know all that he intends for me. 
So today I repent of my selfishness. I repent of living for myself and going so fast and only living life in the loud. I'm responding to you and turning from that life to embrace your whisper. I want to not only live my life with you, but for you. Take the sin that was in my heart and replace it with your spirit. Convict me, guide me, always whisper to me so that I may know exactly what you desire and that you would order my steps like Psalm 5 says. Today I ask that you would come into my life, save me, be my Lord. And I ask all of this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. quaked before moved by the sound of his voice seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken from my regard through it all through it all my eyes are
Amen. What a great reminder this morning. I want to say thank you to Caitlin and to Savvy and to Katie for helping us in worship this morning. Congratulations, ladies, on your graduation. We're proud of you. We're so glad that you have joined us this morning. I want to remind you that all throughout the week you can hear from the fellowship. We're sending devotionals out. There is a Friday devotional that's on video. There's a Wednesday one that we send out via email. So check those. If you need prayer requests, you can email us at prayer at the fellowship.cc. We look forward to seeing you again here online next Sunday. Hope you have a great weekend.